this is not one of those, wow, look at Berlin, isn't it so amazing? It's uh, got such fantastic parking policies. So why can't we do that uh, versions of the Berlin story? Welcome to Reinventing Parking, the podcast about parking policy for anyone who wants a better city and better urban transport. I'm Paul Barter. Today I'm speaking with Jos Nino Notz about parking in Berlin, in Germany. Parking people in my network suggested I speak with Nino primarily because of his excellent master's thesis at the Technical University of Berlin, which looked at conflict between parking and public space from various angles. Nino has been working for several years as a traffic planner and consultant in Berlin, before recently joining the city's team at Buro Happold Engineering. Jos Nino Notz, uh, welcome to the Reinventing Parking podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Paul. So today we're talking about parking policy in Berlin. This is not one of those, wow, look at Berlin, isn't it so amazing? It's uh, got such fantastic parking policies. <laughs> so why can't we do that uh, versions of the Berlin story? Because actually when it comes to parking policy, one thing that I found when I visited in September and talked to you and many other parking experts in, in Germany is that surprisingly – parking policy in Germany has quite a few weaknesses as well as some strengths. So what we'll be trying to do is to learn from both the highs and the lows, I hope. But I think what we'll do is we'll start with one of the strengths or one of the, uh, one of the things that people outside Germany would be quite impressed by, which is the topic of the abolition of parking minimums in Berlin. Right. So as I understand it, in the 1990s, at some point, Berlin abolished its minimum parking requirements completely. C could you tell, tell us a little bit more about that? Of course. It's, it's true. Parking minimums were abolished in Berlin, um, the first city in Germany where it was totally abolished. And I have to add that it's not abolished for bicycle parking and parking spaces for disabled people. So there's still minimums for that. But in the general parking minimums were abolished uh, completely. And um, today, Hamburg, for example, as a second city in Germany, has also abolished its parking minimums. But Berlin was the first. I can say some more to that um, because I met people who were actually um, involved in this ab abolition. And it was actually originally planned to, ins instead of those parking minimums, to actually set parking maximums. And, uh, or at least incorporate the possibility to do so in individual developments. But this did not happen. So we didn't go the final step. To your knowledge, is it, is there any sort of backlash against this policy since it was implemented? It's now more than 20 years. No, there is no, no, uh, backlash, I would say, because liberation is pretty much good for for economy so they can they can do what they want and it's actually pretty popular with builders and owners because uh, it provides them freedom of choice and for them what is most important it provides the possibility to reduce cost in general you could say it's about 10 percent of cost you can save if you don't build so much parking this is also why the trend is kind of spreading in germany but it's mainly because of cost reduction when developers do build office buildings, uh, mm -hmm. residential buildings, do they build significantly less than they used to? And is it common to have parking at almost zero, except for the bicycle parking and the parking for people with disabilities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. There has been some evaluation on that from, from um, an institute for urban studies here in Germany. They looked at some developments that were made after um, after ninety eight. And um, what we can see is that, especially in the context of housing, as I said, a lot of builders um, actually don't build excessive parking anymore because they, they actually do reduce cost and parking. Uh -huh. But especially in the context of very big development, so as you said, like office, shopping centers and stuff, even if they're in the, in the city center, it is still common to build large car parks just as we, are, we were used to. Because these international developments usually they 
they work with international standards and habits and also for them it's important to be able to sell the whole complexes maybe afterwards and so they still build large car parks that's interesting isn't it so for, for people who are in cities where there's a debate going on about minimum parking requirements uh, in, in some ways that's reassuring because the fears that there'll be a huge shortage and an outcry and a huge backlash and problems. You know, in Berlin abolished its parking minimums and there's no clear sign of any huge problems arising. That's reassuring. Mm -hmm. But for those who want to see less parking, it's perhaps uh, slightly disappointing. There's somewhat less parking. Developers can choose and sometimes they take advantage of that. But uh, very often from what you're saying, they still provide maybe too much parking, even in even in certain locations where the, the, the city would like them to build less. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, there's always the, the possibility for administration to negotiate the amount of parking within certain contracts for for certain developments so but uh, in general there was no uproar or actually as i said economy pretty much likes the liberation because they can choose and um, yeah people in the united states or or australia new zealand canada would be expecting you to be talking about uh, residents in dense areas where there's redevelopment going on and new apartment buildings going in uh, because the the competition for on street parking is, is acute is that part of the story in berlin we have a very special situation in berlin that most people actually living in a dense city already today don't don't own a car like if you look at the whole city which is very widespread only half of the household households actually own a car so we have the situation that for a lot of people it's very common to live without a car and so the issue is not that big and the second thing is that uh -huh. we have uh, large amounts of um, buildings from um, the beginning of the 20th century and within that time there were usually no no parking included when the building was um, um, erected so um, these people are used to parking their cars on the streets anyway and they're not worried that new developments uh, a, a new building in the neighborhood would add to the competition for that on-street parking that is a topic you're right but pretty much what it comes down to is people or residents saying we need more parking or we don't want more more buildings <laughs> it's all too dense it's not so the conversation is not so detailed interesting but parking minimums are so far in the past people don't even raise the, them as a possibility perhaps uh, they're concerned about parking competition for parking but the focus of the debate is about things that are possible like stopping that building or uh, providing more parking <laughs> in the area it's not about it's not about requiring these buildings to have more parking right this general regulation the parking minimum or maximum i think this is something that stays very much in the background this is also why politicians uh, had no problem actually abolishing those minimums because only very uh, certain people uh, think about this matter but they were very anxious to go one step further and pe publish parking maximums because that would be something i think that would also yeah raise higher waves you know like it would go more out that there's a right. fundamental change. So they kind of took the easy part. It's, it's all written down. It's, it was just never ratified. Okay, so may, maybe let's move on to another topic. So the first st strength of Berlin's uh, parking is the ab abolition of the parking minimums, which is very impressive. It was across the whole of the city, right? It's not just the inner right. city. You know, the, the Berlin mis municipality does not quite cover the whole metropolitan area, but it's most of it. So that's quite an impressive reform. Uh, the next issue that's reasonably strong, I guess, is that in the very core of the city, and as well as one or two other areas, there is fairly intensive parking management. Uh, could could you describe a little bit more about how that works? Well, um, parking management and the pricing of parking in public streets is uh, the competence of uh, local authorities that is like the city districts and so the city districts themselves look at the situation and okay so berlin is divided into several right. districts that have their own local government right 
the government the local governments are not so strong but it's more about they have they all have their own administration but it, there's a, a big difference between the city districts some are very um, doing intense parking management some are doing none so you you might have been to the spots where for example in the very downtown districts where there's a very um, pretty much the whole area is covered and priced but uh, there's also inner city areas where there's no pricing or management at all the the, the very central area is has strong control mm -hmm. and if you go to the north east a little bit the old it's part of the old east berlin but uh, reasonably far, far out i forget the name of the district Pr prenzlauer Prince. yes Prenzlauer Berg. But if you go directly south of the old city center, I think it's Kreuzberg, right. uh, you find free parking. The, the, the main shopping street in Kreuzberg has free parking. Right. And similarly, if you go northwest into Moabit, mm -hmm. you find free parking, even though it's a very similar area. All three of these areas are very similar. They're old. They're, they're dense. They're, there's a lot of competition for parking, but only one of those areas has intense parking management. The other two don't. Right. So this is this is what you're totally right. This is what I just said that like the boroughs, the administration, and also the po political leadership in the boroughs is different. So some areas are very far, like the very central part, Berlin Mitte, and as you said, and also Prenzlauer Berg. You mentioned that, but for example, Kreuzberg is just starting and they, they see the success in Mitte. So they want to also um, do the same. And of course, also because Kreuzberg is next to Mitte and we have pricing in Mitte means that more people try to evade pricing and put pressure on these surrounding boroughs that not yet have pricing and parking management. So of course, those boroughs kind of uh, also start doing steps, but some do, some don't. Mm. So th there's these three different prices. How do they decide which areas have two euros per hour? In fact, it's, it's actually 50 euro cents per 15 minutes, 75 euro cents per 15 minutes, and one euro per 15 minutes. How is it decided what price is the right price? Um, yeah, when planners, traffic planners look at it and look at the situation, make traffic counts, they also make feasibility studies for how expensive is enforcement how much money do we need to cover all these expenses and with that they make a proposal to the to the borough administration which price they should set in the end the price is politically set so i guess um reading between the lines a little bit there it's not it's not a completely objective scientific process like um, monitoring occupancies as as uh, our friend uh, donald shoop would suggest right but to some extent, demand is part of the story. But as you say, there's a political decision has to be made. The, a politician has to vote to put those prices in. Right. You're totally right. It's not a dynamic pricing scheme. And it's also um, not as, um, how would you say, not as, as complex and detailed as uh, Donald Shoup uh, proposes and what is done in other places. But the the evaluation there's also evaluation going on and if they see that as you mentioned that the parking price is not right they will change it would it be a mistake to say that in those areas that have parking pricing the enforcement of the parking rules is also pretty good or are there some enforcement problems even in these areas i would say the enforcement is pretty good in, in the areas where we have pricing also because enforcement and pricing is connected pretty strongly as i said it's when we plan enforcement it's already um, there's a feasibility study how much enforcement we need so um, it's, it's it's like an integral part of the management scheme the big problem with the enforcement is is in the areas where it's not priced Tell, tell me about the problems with enforcement in the areas that are not priced. The problem is actually very easy. In uh, most areas where there's no parking management, no pricing, there's also no enforcement. That's just uh, pretty much how it is. It's not because um, we don't want enforcement, but it's because enforcement needs a lot of resource, of course. It's expensive. And at the same time, it's also responsibility of the local authorities. So if there is no local revenues from pricing parking that directly funds the, the enforcement, there is, in general, enforcement is neglected. 
it sounds like the penalty revenue does not go to the local government in Germany. Is that correct? To be honest, I think they changed something about it. I think part of it now goes to the local administration. In former times, it did not. It went to the city itself. It, it was not considered part of the, the tra transport sector, but more like of the police work. Uh, they changed something about it. But still, if there's little enforcement, there's also almost no penalties and there's also no money. So, ah, Of course. So it's a little bit of a vicious cycle. Uh, right, right. So if they started to enforce better, then they might find they get some revenue and they could uh, it could be a virtuous cycle. But there's another problem that I heard when I was in Germany. I, there's a national rule that limits the levels of some of the penalties or most of the penalties are set at the national level. Is that correct? Could you explain for the listener? Right. Um, this is actually a, a big part of the problem um, I also identified. Traffic laws, most traffic laws are federal competence. And also setting those penalties and fees is a national thing. And they are very low in Germany. I mean, it's, um, they are so low that if you rationally calculate how much you pay if, if you don't park legally and how much time you save, you would probably be better off in a lot of places just parking somewhere instead of uh, looking for a free parking lot all the time. So this is actually a big problem. The fees are very low. So enforcement is inhibited by a national regulation. Of course, it's it's useful if there's some kind of standardization of right at the national level. So, for example, parking signs right. shouldn't be different from city to city. But it sounds like the, the federal government in Germany has gone too far in regulating too many things about parking. So the enforcement fines right. were one, of, one example. I think there's some other examples. Mm -hmm. Was residential parking permit fees? Was that another example? Yeah, right. Um, this is the second thing. Um, the residential parking fees are also like kept uh, on a on a national level. There's a maximum set by by federal uh, fees, uh, which is uh, thirty euros a year. Mm. I guess. It's quite common for residential parking fees to be low, but usually the decision is is done as a political decision at a local level. It's not something that's set at the national level. Right. In in Germany, are there local governments that want to increase the residential fee to a higher level than 30 euros? There's a big debate going on about this just, just recently. Of course, traffic planners argument for this and uh, also city planners a lot of people a lot of experts say we need to definitely raise those uh, permit prices but i have to add that uh, the residents or a lot of people already already consider this a rip off like there is no in the perception because parking was free all the time for decades there is no real understanding for for the value this opportunity to park And the public space has. Can can you say a little bit more about how the how the various actors in this story talk about parking and frame parking as as a political issue and as, as an economic good? Yeah, what I would like to to stress is that in the federal traffic laws, parking is considered a part of the traffic. So we have this word stationary traffic. So actually, a vehicle that doesn't move and just stands there is also considered traffic. And in our federal traffic laws, which are, I would say, very outdated, there's this idea that traffic needs to be possible for everybody, everywhere, all the time. And this is um, this also reaches out to the stationary traffic. So we have this basic framework in Germany that says, well, we need to provide sufficient parking for everybody, everywhere, and in general, it should not be priced. And if we have bad situation in, in stationary traffic and we are allowed to, to take on measures like pricing schemes, we are restricted in how high we can set the prices by federal law again. That reminds me, we, we forgot to mention something um, earlier when we were talking about the pricing and you just kind of alluded to it is that uh, the on-street parking pricing is seen as a, as a, as a fairly narrow, narrowly framed issue, isn't it? It's purely about managing the on-street parking. Right. In some ways, I, I'm sympathetic to that because I think on-street parking probably is best done that way anyway. But it, it does mean that 
Um, the presumption is parking should be free, as you just said. Right. And so in order to have any pricing, quite quite a, a strenuous effort has to be made to prove that the pricing is necessary. So that's kind of an obstacle, isn't it? Right. Because um, in Germany, the approach cannot be to say, well, we have little urban space. We need more urban space quality for recreation and stuff. And therefore, we need to uh, change the use of public streets and parts and therefore we need to set prices to lower the demand for parking this is not the way it works in germany it works pretty much as you said um, it's a technical issue so if we see that there is a lot of competition for parking and people using cars cannot find a vacant spot only then we can use pricing to soothe the condition and to to make it possible for car users to find a vacant spot again so pretty much it's all about the parking itself and it's not about all the other uses of public street space we could imagine or we would want in a city okay so you, you mentioned the use of street space and public space and uh, in fact that that was the reason i was invited to berlin in the first place because the event i spoke at was it was an event all about uh the use of public space and street space. And I, I was the only one talking about parking in that, in that <laughs> connection. Right. And um, so as I understand it, um, the, 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 the organization that invited me, Agora Fakers Vendor, which is a forum for transport uh, uh, transformation, is very interested in this possibility of street space reallocation and the fact that parking policy and parking practices is an obstacle to that. Right. But I understand that in Berlin, there, there's some progress is being made, right? There, there's a few examples of, of some good things happening. But um, from what you said, it's not fast enough or, or there's also some uh, obstacles. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah. Um, I think there is progress made and also awareness is rising, but there is no real holistic approach to it on on the city level pretty much uh, the mm. cities say well yeah we want to we would like to have more more pricing and enforcement more management in general and so they want the local authorities in the boroughs to to implement that and some follow some don't it's not seen as a, a basic component of like for example a sustainable urban mobility plan or stuff it's not seen as one of the most important measures to to work on travel demand to work on modal choice to work on on the quality of urban urban realm and cities um, this is just not happening yet agorific has vendor presented some examples of some experiments of, of um, rearranging the parking in local streets to tr so that parking plays a role in traffic calming They, there's some loss of spaces, but small, um, but a great improvement in the public realm. Do, do you know much about those examples? There is, of course, also in Germany, in Berlin, but also in other places, uh, a lot of good examples already how urban spaces um, are turned for, from pretty much parking lots to maybe areas with a cre recreational value and quality for just people to, to wander around, sit around and get in contact But of course, it has an imp impact on parking and also parking is very often a very big uh, issue if it comes to um, working with the public on those projects. Yeah, that would be familiar to people in other countries and other cities where, you know, there's a, you know, planners or urban designers will come up with a lovely proposal, but it involves losing a certain small percentage of parking spaces in the district and uh, those parking spaces become the focus of the debate. The street where uh, the mayor of Berlin lives in was actually changed. There was a traffic calming measure within the street where he lived. Six uh, uh, spots for parking um, yeah, had to go, which is not so much, I guess. And he was, uh, how would you say, he was not delighted. He actually made a statement about it in public that this was <laughs> uh, uh, not, that he does not like to see this. So, so bicycle lanes. Um, Berlin has a remarkably high modal share for bicycles, considering that the infrastructure for bicycles is actually rather poor. Yeah. When you actually look at the bike lanes, a lot of them are just paint, and a lot of them are not don't yeah. look very safe to me. But nevertheless, there's a lot of cycling. 
but I understand there's been some progress recently on on creating much improved bicycle lanes, perhaps with protected bike lanes right. now, including parking protected bike lanes. Is, is there a story? What's going on there with par with parking and bike lanes? Yeah, you're totally right. The numbers of people using bike are, are rising, and the, the funding for bicycle infrastructure is uh, went up like by hundreds of uh, of percent. So pretty much the political courage to improve bicycle infrastructure is there. The money is there, but we really still have a big problem spending that money and actually changing the built environment because it's the same issue when it comes down to individual projects and individual streets and we really want to change something. It's, it's usually parking spots that would need to go to have more space for this new infrastructure. And when it comes to that, politicians are still very anxious we had like um, an analysis for like a, a bicycle highway uh, network for the city of berlin and and now it would be the time to have the first bicycle highways uh, be built and it so far uh -huh. it doesn't happen because no one one in the boroughs wants to make the start no local politician wants to be the first who says we are getting a bicycle highway and yeah, we will uh, get rid of a few hundred parking spots. Yes. <laughs> so this this is all somewhat amusing to me because uh, <laughs> as, a, as a parking and transport consultant, very often the German Technical Assistance Agency, GIZ, employs me. And for example, I might go to China or India. And often I'll point to Berlin as a place with pretty good parking management, pretty good parking policies. I might port to point to the abolition of the parking minimums uh, and, and so on. But, uh, of course, everything's relative. <laughs> so <laughs> right. um, Berlin, from the perspective of a Chinese city with, with complete and utter parking chaos in the streets, uh, Berlin looks mm. very good. But uh, when you're actually in Berlin, it could be so much better and there's still a lot there's a lot of room for improvement. So I, I gather from your perspective, you're looking to places like Swiss cities and Austrian cities as examples that do right. a little better, maybe, maybe Dutch cities. Is that right? Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and I just, uh, I, you're totally right. It depends on the perspective, of course. I mean, in Germany, as most, pretty much most things are very much in order and probably designed and there's a lot of ne negotiations before something is implemented. So the conditions are, are pretty good. And as I said, not very many people live without a car. So also the, the pressure is not too high. This is maybe also why not so much has changed in the past, but uh, now we're coming to a point where we would, a lot of people would want more change and, for for me, I as you said, I look to Switzerland, I look to the Netherlands, or I also look to to other places in Scandinavia where where they are much further, and also they they are more courageous to say that we we want the the whole central business district to be car free in five years, and that they're, they're just going for it, right? So thank, thanks a lot, Nina. Thanks for being on the Reinventing Parking podcast. Thank you for having me, Paul. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to the Reinventing Parking podcast, and I'm Paul Barter. You can find out more at reinventingparking.org, where you'll find ideas and tips on parking policy. You can also listen to other episodes, subscribe, or leave a comment. That's reinventingparking.org. Bye for now. <laughs>